Oh, hello, friends. I'm sitting here in a car uh, along the Lehigh, Little Lehigh River. Uh, it's raining. I made a different video earlier, and uh, you might have seen that, or I might not have posted it yet. I don't know what order these things are going to go out in. But I am here, and I'm going to have a pipe, and I thought I would share that with you and uh, talk a bit about something. So this is, uh, this is just an old basket pipe. The only nomenclature that it has on it anywhere is on the stem is stamped the word Mexico. I uh, bought this years ago at, uh, actually at a tinderbox with a basket pipe. It did suffer a tragic uh, fall where the shank cracked off of it. And this was actually one of my earliest pipe repairs. And you can see the seam there. I didn't do a good job with it, but hey, it works. And uh, I love this pipe. It's uh, completely inexpensive. Ugly as all get out. You know, there's, there's just nothing nice about it but it does the job and it's probably one of the first I don't know maybe four or five pipes that I bought and we got this C&D Burley Flake number one I tell ya you can't get haunted bookshop anywhere I got it cellar and I'm not worried but um, I don't like to break into the cellar because that's my retirement plan Everybody sold out, so I, I switched to this stuff. If this was available in bulk, I would never buy Haunted Bookshop again. I love Burley Flake number one. Uh, there's another one. I can't get the numbers straight. There's another one. So this one has a fair amount of Virginia in it. I think it's Virginia, Burley, and Perique. Um There's another one that doesn't have Virginia, but it's got it's got more Burley and it's got darker Burley. And that one is also fantastic. Um, and then there's a couple that have Turkish and Latakia in them, and I don't typically like that stuff, so I, I never tried them, to be honest. But the non, uh, non latakia Burley Flakes are, I can I can speak very highly of them, and I'm sure the other ones are good if you like Latakia. Anyway, Burley Flake number one. And I'm going to light that up. So I've been thinking a lot, and this isn't a roadway ramble, by the way. This is something I've really been thinking about and, and wanted to, to have a chat about. The concept of romanticism in pipe smoking. Do we romanticize what we're doing? Do we do it to an extent that it's problematic? I don't even know what that means, to be honest. Do we romanticize pipe smoking? I think without a doubt we're all guilty of doing that. And that's okay. I don't think it's a bad thing to do. But I do wonder, what do we bring to pipe smoking? versus what pipe smoking brings to us. You know, in essence, this this thing, and I chose this pipe today because I wanted to talk about this. You know, this is ugly as all get out. It cost me, I think, like maybe $12 when I bought it. Um, terrible, the stem isn't well fit. Uh, it, it just, it's just, it's, it's the essence of what a pipe is. A pipe is a couple of well-designed holes surrounded by briar and rubber and maybe a crack. Uh, and yeah, you can make them out of other things, but you, you get the point. It, the geometry of the holes is what's important. The stuff that's not there is what's important. I think that's worth some thought, really. So, given that, what does this bring to us? What what are we actually receiving from this? You know, you hear people talk about things like, and I'm not I'm not singling anyone out. I'm not I'm not trying to be negative about it, but people will say things like, "That was such a better experience because I had my pipe with me." And that might be true. This pipe's been through a lot with me. You know, I've had it for gosh, thirty some years now. 
made a lot of memories with this pipe in my hand. And just the story of breaking it and repairing it, you know, makes it somehow special. Let's uh, get on the road and continue this discussion. So, I can look at this and I can say, boy, this pipe is, is, is magical in a sense because it's, it's been with me through all this stuff and it reminds me of those things. And, but that's not the pipe's fault, really, if you think about it. How the heck do I get out of here? I just realized that the do not enter. I must have to go around the other way. Ah, exit over there. So yeah, the, the pipe isn't really bringing anything magical. You're bringing that. You're you're taking your experiences and attaching them to an object, and we do it all the time. And it's it's fine. It's a good thing to do. That's why we have objects that we have that we can't part with. That's what objects with sentimental value are. And a pipe certainly can have sentimental value. I think a lot about when I was first learning to, to smoke a pipe. And you know, I had the good fortune of, of starting at a time when there still were a fair number of brick and mortar tobacco shops. And I hung out in them. Well, not hung out, but I spent time in them when I was in Atlanta, when I was in Pittsburgh especially, and when I was in Atlanta for a while. And there were always guys hanging out in these shops, old guys, you know, guys in their, their 70s, guys that are retired in their 70s, hanging out, smoking pipes. These were, and, and this was the 80s, remember? So, you know, we're talking about guys that were born close to the turn of the century. And, you know, th this is this is really, when we talk about codgers, these are the guys we're talking about. They didn't have much time for me. You know, I was a goofy kid. Didn't know what I was doing. Most of my direct interactions with them were them pointing out what I was doing wrong. And usually laughing at me for doing it. But I learned from that. I learned a lot from it. When they weren't making fun of me, they'd be talking to one another. And they'd be talking about various topics. Just wanna make sure I know how to get home. Uh, they'd be talking about various topics, um, things like baseball or politics, local politics, definitely local politics. Uh, maybe something that you know, someone died, something happened to someone. Uh, there was a crime down the street or something. Uh, and local politics. Th those were the main topics of conversation. Um, Oh, yeah, somebody's daughter or granddaughter had a car problem or needed a new roof on their house or something. You know, th those kinds of things. These guys got up in the morning, stuffed a pipe, drank some coffee, stuffed a pipe. These guys were consummate pipe smokers. They would come into the tobacconist, they would buy... Well, actually, they, I was going to say they would buy a pound, but they, they didn't do that. I remember very clearly them coming with their pouch, and they would have them weigh out a few ounces of tobacco and pour it directly into their pouch. It was always the same tobacco. You know, they, they all smoked whatever their blend was, but it was always that tobacco. And, and the guy or woman behind the counter knew that and could just, as, as they approached the counter, would just reach for that jar. These guys did not talk about some things. Some things were really missing from, from their conversation that I find interesting. And this, I'm not trying to be negative about this. I'm just drawing a, a contrast here. 
they never talked about the ultimate pipe smoking experience. They never talked about how the pipe heightened their enjoyment of an event. They never talked about their top five blends of the year. You know, th this is not... This was not something that these old codgers thought about. You know, they, they smoked whatever they smoked, and they were happy with it, and they got on with life. They talked about the things that were important to them, not about their pipes. Their pipes were just well-designed holes surrounded by briar and rubber that allowed them to burn tobacco, period. And that is how they approached it. And that's fine. They were happy. None of my business. I don't think that's how we approach it. I don't think we we have that, that approach very much anymore. We might try to, you know, emulate what we believe is a codger. But we're never going to be that. Because that those guys were a product of their time. They grew up in a world where pipe smoking was normal. They grew up in a world where it would be odd for a man to not smoke a pipe. My generation saw a little bit of that, but it all quickly changed. Very quickly. Anybody younger than me Anybody born after, say, 1970, they have no experience like that. They see it in movies, they, but they have no experience of that culture that produced these men. So we can't expect that our approach to pipe smoking is going to be the same as theirs. You know, and I know that when people say, oh, I want to be a codger, or oh, I'm, I'm a codger, they're not trying to say that they're exactly the same. I, I get that, but it, but it's an important point that's been on my mind for a while now. You know, we're emulating people that actually would tell us to go take a hike. <laughs> they didn't care about any of the things that we seem to care about, and uh, yeah, it, it's just, I think it's interesting to draw that contrast. So we tend to be much more romantic about pipe smoking. We talk about the ultimate pipe smoking experience, or some folks do. Uh, we talk about how the pipe has you know, changed how we, we see things, or given us time for relaxation, or um, maybe uh, we, we, we think about, you know, over the course of the year, we try lots of different tobaccos, and, and we, we like to talk about what we thought was good, what we thought was bad. That's a very different lifestyle than, than those true codgers had. And maybe that's the modern codger lifestyle. You know? I don't know. I think it's kind of silly to attach significance to the word codger when, you know, it, it really was meant as a derogatory term for a cranky old man. Romanticization of this is not new, and this is something that was pointed out to me by the artful codger, and he's absolutely right. You know, there's a history in literature of romanticizing the pipe. You know, and this goes back to, I believe, mostly the um, late 1800s. And you've got things like um, lots of poetry that was published in periodicals um, talking about the pipe and, and, and lady nicotine and tobaccos and all of that. You know, stuff that's like, um, I'm trying to remember the opening of one of them that, that I always thought was cute. Um, give, give me Virginia weed, an earthen bowl, and a stem of reed. You know, that kind of stuff. Um, this, is, this was heavily influenced by romanticism, you know, romantic poets like Coleridge and Wordsworth and folks like that. And 
but it was it was later than that time, and it was mostly a mechanical attempt at creating similar works, but on topics that those works just really don't work with, in my opinion. Uh, I I don't. Yeah, some people like it. I don't. But it's okay. It, it's not bad. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just that it's not my thing. Uh, there was also William Barry, who I think it was William Barry. Barry um, wrote "Ode to Lady Nicotine" or something like that. And again, lots lots of flowery language. And, and so there's a history of this going going back certainly to the late 1800s. Um, so we're in good company when we do it. I I worry a little about the emphasis on it. And this really is, is kind of the, the main point I'm, I'm working towards here. When we emphasize the transformative smoking experience, the heightened awareness of, 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 of a happy event, the 500 blends I tried this year, we are, in a sense, doing a disservice to the beginning pipe smoke. You know, I, I don't really know why I started smoking a pipe. I, I don't know. I can't remember the rationale or anything. I, I do remember being happy that I could smoke it in the winter when I was walking uh, without having to have my hand out of my pocket, whereas when I smoked cigars that was not possible without lighting my pocket on fire. So maybe that was the only reason. I don't remember. Um, but other people have reasons that are, you know, more significant than that. You know, you, you might have wanted to be Bing Crosby or Danny Kay or, you know, maybe you wanted to, uh, the, the, the fantasy books of Tolkien influenced a lot of people. Maybe that's what, what made you first pick up a pen. Uh, there's, there's lots of things like that that can sort of spark the interest. But if you start smoking a pipe based on that, and a few weeks later you're not being Crosby, you shouldn't put the pipe down. And I don't think anybody would, because nobody really expects to become Bing Crosby. Nobody really expects to turn into one of Tolkien's dwarfs. Um, you want to share something with that. With that you know? But when we talk about these you know, transformative smoking experiences, I think we're setting an expectation. Guys, it's going to take you a long time as a beginning pipe smoker to experience that. Uh, the first thing you got to do is learn to smoke the darn pipe, and then you got to break in the pipe, and that that takes a lot of effort. And then you've got to learn to enjoy the tobaccos, and then that will all come together. And when it does, it's wonderful. I tell you, it does happen. That is not romanticizing. There is something that happens every once in a while, and every pipe smoker talks about this. Where you just go, wow, this bowl is the, you know, this is wonderful. And then you load the pipe up again, thinking it was the tobacco, and it, it, it's flat. It's just not the same. And I don't know what cause, nobody knows what causes it, but it happens. And it's going to happen to you, but it's not going to happen to you in the first six months of your pipe smoking. Uh, so when you, when you see guys talking about that, they're just sharing their excitement. They're sharing their, their love of, of what they do. But you shouldn't consider it to be the norm, and you shouldn't necessarily expect that that's what you're going to experience. The best advice you can give a new pipe smoker, in my opinion, is buy an inexpensive briar, a basket pipe, preferably a billiard, nothing bent because they're more trouble. Find a tobacco you like. 
think about what you want to be tasting. Do you want sweet? Do you want flavored? Do you want hearty? Do you want smoky? And based on that, you can pick out what, what you're going to smoke. And then buy eight ounces of it and don't stop until the eight ounces are gone. Don't change anything until you've smoked through that eight ounces. And keep doing that. At some point, that pipe will come alive. This is not romanticism. This is, this is reality. The pipe will change and you will begin to have these wonderful experiences. As you do that, you're going to look around you and you're going to incorporate that into what's happening in your life. And you're probably going to start saying things like, the pipe has made this a better experience, or pipe smoking makes this more enjoyable. It's not true. You like pipe smoking, and you're doing something you enjoy, and that's the bottom line. But it takes work. So don't give up. Well, that's about all I wanted to say on that topic. And I think I might be done with this bowl. And I don't want to show you my skill at reloading a pipe while I'm driving. can reload when driving, but doing it from a tin is frankly kind of stupid. Anyway, folks, I am about 20 minutes from home. The rain has stopped. I will probably be going into work this afternoon. So... Tomorrow's Friday. I'll see you then. And I hope you all have a, have a good one. Take care.